you know, that really relates to questions of power, allocation of resources, you know, which vision of the future is being, you know, is being privileged at this university or at any place itself. But these are questions for the naturalists. <laughs> Sorry, I just flew in. The, um, okay, I'm just trying to get people that haven't spoken. Yes? Oh, that's really nice. Yeah, but there has been a crash in language. I think in contemporary technological culture, language, in my lifetime, language is incredibly narrowed down. The language of reading and the language of uh, just talking is really narrowed down and continues to go to recycle in ways. I mean, a lot of things, you know, people become like repeating machines. And, you know, the mediascape is so powerful. Like a person who ran for office once said, well, if you go to door to door and knock on doors and talk to people, what you will hear door to door is what was on last night's edition, yesterday's edition of the Gazette. You know, really, he said his, for him it was like eerie, it was like almost like spectral, like ghosts in some ways. Because you just really hear the same, you know, like same kind of repetition that goes from one to another. So I think language itself, most of all, has been really burrowed into and fractured apart and sort of streamlined itself. And not even to the content of the language, but what about the gestures of the language? What about the gestures of the language that are picked up from popular television shows? Where suddenly you're out in the streets and suddenly everybody's, you know, just you can really pick up threads of like the ways in which words are said or expressions are said. Language itself gets broken into. And then language gets massaged to fit the time. The language that I use and think in today is not the language that I used and thought in 20 or 25 years ago for myself. You know, 25 years ago, my consciousness of computers was pretty nil. That was just sort of emerging. And the consciousness and the language that I've used would have been a much more intensely political language. And before that, a much more religious language. So I think the language sometimes crashes, but always gets streamed in the culture within which it's embedded. Now, who, so hold on, <laughs> okay, Are there any, did you have your, did you wish to say, are you sure? Okay, hand here, here, and then the last two comments, I'm gonna take a break, yep. Uh, to go back to the place of your earlier point, our physical reality isn't even going to be determined for by the future state. Our physical our reality? Our society is one where everything is recorded and, and reflected from the more of our social reality. Maybe I can use this as one thing, for, for example, at the IUC, record or your student ID, for example, your bank cards, anything else, and in a lot of cases, our, our the social reality and the, and our place in the system are, are de determined defined by by machines. Huh. So it, it's not really an issue so much of it that that they're, they're they're part of or not a part of us, but that it, it, they're, they're, that they're part of our connection to the rest of the rest of society. There there are our place within our place. Yes, you can speak. I guess I sort of wanted to draw attention to what is in my mind is the discrepancy between technology that is born out of necessity and the other kind of technology which I think Duncan was alluding to that sort of we create out of boredom and sort of depend on the thing. And I think we are dependent on the ones that we create out of technology. And it's hard to make the same argument when there are people that need to dial for three times a week to live. And I mean, this, it can sort of lead to but an arrogance that can exist. So there's an inherently conflictual relationship between people that are subservient to this technology, a la privilege or Vonnegut has a lot of stories like that, and people that are, I mean, this is really turning to a pitch now, so I'll keep moving on. That's okay. Um, to me, there's two inaccuracies that conflict that. It's hard to sort of tell people or try and inform people of like what their right to life, their right yeah, and what would you call dependency then? Like what's your what's your notion of dependency or or necessity? I think a, a, a physical like when people when people's life essence are I, they just can't breathe right. That's what you hook up into basically. You 
people's actual existence depends on technology that brings that. Okay. Which does exist. Like, there's people that can't live in our society without things that we have inorganically developed. Okay. Have you ever seen that Fellini film? It might be Satyricon, when part of the game show is there's a family that's exiled, and they're, you know, they're exiled, and what the experiment, they're, the cruel experiment is they're not allowed to watch TV for a whole month. And then just part of the game show, it's like it's sort of a precursor of Survivor. They're sort of brought back on, and the whole family is sort of staggering because they haven't been pixelated for a whole month. And they said, oh, it was terrible, particularly for the children and the older people. It was a terrible, terrible thing. And, you know, Fellini's point was that, of course, televisual culture is a necessity for our culture as well. And so the, even the realm of necessity versus what would be excess gets very blurred, actually, in some ways. Like, would our culture survive if you didn't have the cir if we didn't have the circulation of images? I know the ice storm and stuff like this is true. Would our culture or civilization survive? Our Civil culture, of course, would survive. What would our culture survive as? It's just interesting if you stripped away these. What would really happen? Like, I have a number of students in very many classes. Like, I've noticed like, in the last several years, real tendency among students is they find it very healthy. People really want to unplug themselves. Really want to, in food, go much more natural in food. Really try to control how much images they see. And they sort of like just have this kind of desire to sort of denumb themselves in some ways, which you see is sort of interesting. And to that, I, but then I always think, well, like technology is sometimes you voluntarily can say you're going to unplug. But there's other forms of technology you can't unplug from. They circulate through your body itself. They circulate through your imagination, and the plugs are already put very deep in the sense of artificial feelings and artificial memories and artificial food, for that matter. You know, So the question of technology ceases to be like an object outside of ourselves and begins to circulate within us. And how do you really unplug from it? And how do you decide? Because it's such a good point. Like, what would be necessity and what would be excess within this? And do we really like necessity, or would we always privilege the excessive. So, uh, yes, the last comment. Okay. Um, you just kind of sparked something back to the uh, well, artificial memory and people again. But like I think we're thinking yes, too. If you've watched news footage, then that is an artificial memory that you've seen because you are remembering something that you did not personally see. But I think Well, that's, that's, that's not a real memory if you haven't actually experienced it. Yeah, but, no, but it isn't an art, like, hmm. if, if, for example, it was some kind of virtual reality thing, which could be determined that, where you could plug in and experience the news footage as though you were really there, then that would be an artificial memory. But your memory isn't of what the camera's taking, your memory is of watching it on the TV. Real memory. <laughs> no, no, I, was, I was trying to sneak that in. <laughs> oh, you're so smart. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a lot of perspectives. It's really interesting and real uh, lines of themes and argumentation. So really, we have on the table to think about is what's, you know, what really is human? Like what's natural and what's unnatural? What's an artificial memory and what's sort of a real memory? And what's the question of evolution itself? And can a species evolve its extermination, its own point of, ex its own point of disappearance? I mean, my thesis, at least on when I study the discourse, you know, just what scientists write about molecular biology and genetic engineering, is that operating behind that unconscious, you know, unknown to scientists themselves, I don't know if they've thought about it, is in fact they are experimenting with the disappearance of the human species itself, mindlessly. 
just absolutely mindlessly. And this good German writer, Martin Heidegger, said that a characteristic of, of an advanced technological culture would be the spread of mindlessness. You know, like really capricious kind of experiments. I mean, you can, you go to molecular, you go to genetic engineering conferences, and you'll have um, the guys who do the commercial companies coming out of this, and they'll say, you know, we can create right now skin graft, artificial skin. Next week we'll be able to do, you know, next month or next year we'll be able to do a finger. After that we'll do a whole arm. By God, we're going to be able to do a whole body itself. And all this, but no kind of thought about, well, what are the consequences of that? Like, what are the consequences of when you begin actually to splice together the artificial with the creation of artificial limbs that become like the real limbs of human beings itself? And you, you're no longer human beings, but you are transgenic beings. I mean, are we really ready to be post-human? And that's, I think that's what this, these articles are asking, or these films ask about. Are we really ready for the advent of the post-human? And has the spark, what is your name again now? Your name? Yeah, that has the spark that you've talked about uh, that brings life to technology suddenly. Is that in the future, or in fact, has that already happened? And we're sort of the first inhabitants of a world in which technologies have come alive as some kind of strange life form. Well, a lot of people working in films, like Matrix doesn't get made because people don't think technology is a life form. Matrix gets made because the technologies are thought about as life forms. Artificial intelligence asks what is the relationship between you know, a human being, a mother, and a son who's a robot? And you know, as I said, to ask that fundamental question of human beings, can a mother reciprocate the absolutely unquenchable love of a robotic child for herself? Are human beings capable of loving robots? Artificial intelligence forms not the other way around. So these are all questions that films are asking, which are at the interface of the human and the post-human. And you know, like a very wonderful book written by um, a, a theorist and person who writes in English, Catherine Hales. You know, she has written a book on the culture of the post-human. And you may want to take a look at that book sometime, because she really begins with the thesis that we are already living in a post-human culture itself. So, but to go back to these articles and the articles on the, you know, the Terminator and Blade Runner, where we'll just pick up after a break, you know, really are just asking these kind of fundamental questions. And you can see from your really, really insightful and wise remarks that, you know, it's really contentious terrain. And it raises really fundamental questions as to what is the meaning of the natural now and what is the meaning of the subnatural? And do we have an anthropomorphic perspective? Are we repeating the errors of the early Europeans? It's possible. Do you want to take a break? Yes. With now the good guy, like the, the sort of the sort of like nostalgic machine, just the, the parts covered with the skin that wasn't really capable of being you know <coughs> before was so cold and mechanical. It was now able that was to nice. assume human characteristics. And then there was this sort of new threat, which was like the sort of uh, in disguise technology, the one that you could never tell was either real or not real. It was so far advanced that it was more than human. It could imitate, it could do everything. But they had to create a new look for technology to make it evil again, something that was scary, you know? Like, now if Terminator 3 is coming out, I don't know if that's just going to be a, a simple, like, knockoff action movie, or if there's going to be some kind of further development of, like, yeah. what's scary now? Like, after we've gone to this point where we're almost, like, you know, we almost care for our PCs now. You know, when they get a virus, we're kind of freaked out. We're worried we're going to lose all of our, our data or whatever. And now, like, we need something new to fear. What, what's it going to be? Is it going to come back to a human? Like, some of the other first. Yeah, <laughs> like a fundamentalist human who's on the side of the machines. Maybe that's the ultimate fear, you know, like, like Saddam Hussein. I mean, we're going to war now. I mean, there's some other article that we had to read at one, somewhere at one of the first first ones, where I was talking about first and third world countries, and you were talking about Islam, Islamic countries versus us, and it seems like the first world countries, like, I mean, Dick Cheney's is a cyborg, he's a pacemaker, I mean, like, we are the society of cyborgs going to war with the non-cyborgs, like, we are the technology, like, facing the non, the natural, really, I mean, 
what I see is that maybe Baghdad is technologically wider, but the suburbs are third world countries where I mean, yeah. they don't have any in their houses. So it's like let's, let's not get carried away now. Yeah. No, because they're. Going to war because they have technology. Yeah, and they're willing to use it against us. Supposedly. Supposedly. Yeah, exactly. The case is waiting to be proved. Well, I mean, it is. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. It's basically, I mean, don't you get a feeling it's a complete con job? Like, I said, well, two months ago, no one was worrying about this, or this was not on the tip of everybody's tongue. Every news story, in your whole news scans for whole days are not drenched with stories of the evil Saddam Hussein and things like this. You know, like in brilliant detail. So you have to ask, like, Escobar would say, well, what is the social construction of those images like why what's the what actually you know the political question what interests are they serving why are they being served up to us now how is this it's what uh, Jean Baudrillard would call stage communication <coughs> carefully staged carefully prepared and packaged nothing else no other perspectives are allowed to be voiced like even Al Gore <coughs> yesterday you know agree or disagree with him but Al Gore gave a great speech and for my I thought a great speech in San Francisco and I noticed on the news in which he just said Really, you know, this language of, um, you know, us and them is polarizing the world, and any possibilities of alliances and stuff are just being broken apart. And you really have, uh, he said, the war is really basically about oil. That's what this is about. And he says, and he didn't think that Congress should be so compliant, should really, you know, have a debate on it. You know, things that Congress, the United States Congress, should do. And I noticed on the when they played that on um, ABC. You had an image of Al Gore. Said Gore gave a speech, and then they didn't. You couldn't hear one word that he said. They did a voiceover of him, and they only allowed the speech to appear in fragments of the speech in print, meaning it's a lesser medium and stuff like this. So, you know, really, if we're talking about you know media technology and politics, we should really talk about the social construction of images, how their communications are staged, and how populations are mobilized. Like Paul really also says that a real form the politics takes today is that there's like a war machine that operates and the war machine really operates in using a kind of almost metabolic logic. It actually hijacks the minds and feelings of people. It comes inside of people. So later on, you know, we'll go to in um, B. B. Catman's article when he talks about um, Merleau Ponty, about the phenomenology of perception and says that, you know, perception is controlled. And it's also constructed very carefully. And if that does I'll come to that in a moment. I thought that was really, you know, like a really such a reflective comment, because we're living in a time in which perception, most of all, is controlled, like really carefully controlled, at least public perception, and it takes incredible perseverance to have a different perspective. I think, you know, really, so it's good. And to the question, what do we fear the most? Like, for my money, if you're doing a sci-fi movie today, I wouldn't have machines as fearful. I'd have human beings as fearful. I mean, human beings seem to be absolutely out of control. I mean, and I would say the machines have a lot to fear from us, because we really have a predatory logic, and we're bored. You know, it's a culture of boredom that begins to play with nature, begins to play with the future of our bodies, begins to play with images. It makes, as Nietzsche says, it's possible, and maybe it's a culture, maybe the high point of a technological culture is a culture that begins to make itself sick. You know. It's at certain times, and then out of that, you know, comes very dangerous things. So, I mean, all of these articles, like a lot of the films, I'm just going to go and close this. A lot of the films, really, like Terminator and Blade Runner, and Matrix, and films like this, really, you know, they're films about power, but they're also films about nihilism. I thought. You know, because they really talk about the ambivalence of the relationship between human beings and the technologies that they supposedly have created. And, you know, and usually end in real either humanist fantasies or violence itself. Now, uh, I'll go on with that. Did anyone else have their hand up? Okay. So I'd, I'd just like to just end this discussion of the films just by really encouraging you to see Blade Runner. I don't want to be a shill for a movie. But this is really is one film, like in the context of this class, you really should see, because it's really, it's just a really interesting film. And what I find both interesting about these films is that the futures that they talk about are actually pretty near to us, eh? I mean, after all, the Terminator 1, the future is 2029. 
doesn't seem all that long, long way. And in Blade Runner, the future is the year 2019. 2019, that's like 17 years from now. I said, well, so really, they're speaking about the present. Yes? Yeah, maybe it's better to use fiction as a history and to have an alternate thesis and say 1984 has always existed. Mm -hmm. We've always been in a society of immense surveillance, draconian policing, exactly. tight social controls. Yeah. Did you see last night that they were triumphantly presenting the fact that you, if you just surrender all your privacy, you can get iris scanned at the airports mm -hmm. so that you can, if you're a business person, they say you have to pay 50 bucks for it as well so that you can go through the lines, the passport lines much quicker. Now all you got to do for that is tell them everything about yourself and allow them to do a background criminal and political check on you. Hey, what's a little history? You know, and that gives you the, that gives you the um, right to be iris scanned. And of course at the airports you have an advantage, you can go through the lines quicker. But you know, someone from Xerox Park told me when they were showing me their latest uh, technologies of surveillance, they said, well, who wants privacy anyway? Privacy was something that was foisted on us and something we never really wanted. And we're going to provide technologies that allow you to get rid of privacy. So I thought I didn't say it. I thought, I was, oh, well, I'm not quite sure I agree with this argument. But if that's the way it's going to be in the future, we have to march along and stuff like this. So it's interesting how the technologies are suddenly introduced and they turn upside down human rights and civil liberties. And article, you know, like something like 1984 is. I mean, is that in our future, or are we already 1984? When I was down in the States, I just kept saying 1984. Mm -hmm. This is really, and, as, and I also kept thinking to myself, this is as good as it gets. Because all my life I've been reading about liberal democratic societies and how they have about them like a language of freedom. And I go down to the United States and I say, well, this is a really advanced liberal democratic society. This is, you know, the example of what freedom is. It's not going to get any better than this. It's probably going to go downhill from here. And so I now think of it sort of retrospectively, an experiment that somehow went a little bit awry and stuff. Now Blade Runner asks, you know, this question, you know, in 2019, the replicants come back from, you know, the replicants come back, they have what, four year life cycles. And they come back, so they have points of termination which are programmed into them. They come back desperately wanting to find really their founder to get reprogrammed to have a little bit more life. And the LA cops who are called Blade Runners are assigned to search them down. And they try it through the tests of the eye itself. And in the film, you know, the eye is always major. You do the voight comp test. The capillary is in the eye during interrogation. Your voice can lie. Your memories can lie. Replicants don't even necessarily know they're replicants. They have artificial memories. But the eye will tell you everything. And the eye in the film is everywhere. It's the eye over the city. It's the eye of the owl. It's the Tyro corporate headquarters. Its eyes is genetically grown in the lab or photographs. But seeing is a failure because in the end eyesight doesn't necessarily reveal a replicant. And maybe certain Blade Runners don't even know that they themselves are replicant itself. And the film really blurs the boundaries between what is natural and what is unnatural. That's why I think like in the discussion we've had, it's such a good film to go see. Because when I saw the film, I completely identified with the replicants. Just completely. I thought these are definitely improved beings. They have kind of faster memories. They definitely have seen many more things than we could ever see. They have intensified feelings. And they have like real sensitivities. And most of all, they have like this just desire to live intense emotions and just desire to live in a profound feeling of tragedy. That they can see their own time, the four year cycle ticking away. And they're just des they don't want to be treated like machines or like some artificial life form that can be thrown in the junk pile. 
they want to be extended as well. They have what human beings have, which is that you're approaching death at any moment in your life, and you're born with like a will to live and a real feeling of anguish and desire to live. And if you've ever, has anyone, your friends or your family has ever died, and you've been with them close to the death or at their deathbed, you just feel, you know, for yourself and for them, like this just desire just to cling on to life and, you know, to find like some form of, you know, like way to persevere itself. And it's the same for the replicants itself. And at the very end of the film, there's that fa famous scene which Roy Batty, in one of the replicants, you know, he's dying. His, you know, algorithmically programmed genetic clock is ticking down. And he's conscious that he's dying itself. And just to allow himself to feel for one moment more, he takes like a, a spike or a needle and just, or a knife and just puts it through his hand itself, you know, just to pain, just to hold on. And then just gives this completely spontaneous speech, which was not scripted at all. You know, the speech that I have seen, you know, the fire is off the Aurelis. And this beautiful speech about things that he has seen is traveling through the universe itself. And then, of course, he dies itself. And so when I watched the film, I thought, you know, so I thought, well, what a great film this is. Because I thought, well, what's the difference between a replicant and a human being itself, except the human beings of the film are a lot more predatory. They're the Blade Runners who sort of, you know, mindlessly go around and with great predatory power, you know, hunt down the replicants. And they themselves don't even know the director's cut. You know, oh, I don't want to say any more. <laughs> that there may be certain ambivalences in the film itself. <laughs> but as I watched the film, I thought, well, you know, just think about the really eloquent and good comments made here about, you know, natural and unnatural. Well, really, if you just think of it from another perspective, what is the real difference at some point between artificial life forms and ourself in terms of emotion and wills to live? And I think that's like a film like The Blade Runner makes that question of what the boundary is really ambivalent. And that's, you know, the, why the film has been, over the years, has just been so seductive for people itself and raises, you know, political questions. You know, what happens, political questions which become, you know, like of signal important to us in terms of, you know, the techno culture within which we live. Like really, what happens when artificial intelligence is grafted for the first time onto genetically engineered organs? Do replicants have political rights? When the AI joins genetically engineered organs, do replicants have political rights and are going to be willing to recognize that they have political rights? When the first human clone is born, within, what, a year, two years, will that clone be recognized as a life form? And will it have civil rights? Or are those clones going to be born to immediately be processed in factories where they might not even have a head? You know, there's lots of images which scientists don't like to evoke, but seem to be images which are, you know, in circulation, that just instead of using pigs cruelly in factories and have their bodies sequestered for their life, and they'll be used as sources of artificial organs, natural artificial organs, why not, in fact, develop clones? Clones, human beings, don't have to have any intelligence. You don't even have to grow them with any legs or arms. If you're interested in organs, they're just going to be organ farms. They're going to be some kind of recombinant creature sitting in rows of thousands of them that'll just be harvested of their organs itself. In several years, that will be quite possible. And just watching what happens in the language of genetic engineering with what we do to animals and to plants, well, why wouldn't we do that to an alien species of clones as well? After all, we want to live, and we just will say, these are our artificial life resource. You know, some kind of neutral language which pacifies them, takes sort of like the emotion out of it. And we'll say, anyway, it's good for us because it'll facilitate our life, and they're a subordinate life form. They're a resource itself. So the question we would ask, ask politically, and certainly within your lifetime, this will be a political issue, is when clones are born, are they to be born just to, to be harvested of their organs for our benefit? Or are they to have civil rights? Are they to have human rights and legal rights? 
what happens to questions of class and gender and race in the age of genetic engineering? And will the real struggle of tomorrow lie between genetically superior classes fabricated from the best transplants and the best genetics and the best DNA in genetically colonized classes? And don't think that that's too far in the future because aren't we in some ways already in this age of the post-human? After all, we depend, we really depend in very practical ways on chips for faster living, for connectivity in the economy, for running our homes and telephones and cars. We randomly eat genetically modified foods. It's very difficult not to because after all, there's no labeling on the packaging itself. So that would mean that recombinant genetics is already deeply in our bloodstream. Medically, our lives depend on being continually scanned. We are no stranger to the scanning machines. MRIs and CAT scans and tomography and x-rays and cinema screens and television screens and computer screens and now iris scans as well. And if you get bored with yourself, then simply take a walk through any downtown mall area and you'll be scanned continuously by really unobtrusively hidden and sometimes very privilegedly profiled video surveillance machines itself. And if you want to see your photographic other, just take some money out of the bank. Your photograph is being taken. You're being scanned of your image itself. So really, where does being human begin and end? And at one point do the machines begin to enter into us? Are we so singular or are we already sort of hybrid creatures? Part human, but also part scans. You know, part technology that sort of doesn't stay outside of us, but comes inside of us ourselves. And that's the question that's being raised in these series of films like AI and Matrix and Terminator and Blade Runner and Short Circuit and The Net. I mean, all these films are just hovering around this question of blurred boundaries. What succeeds the human? Does the hybrid succeed the human? What does it mean to live as a hybrid? And what's going to happen to our successor species itself? And in terms of genetically superior classes, you know, who depend on organ transplants for others, I mean, this isn't the future. This is already part of our reality. Think of, you know, organ harvesting from Haitians. It's gone on for years. Think of those political prisoners in China. Lots of reports out of China that the Chinese state and the privileged classes in China sometimes, in fact, will pe pick people up in the streets who look like healthy organ donors, and the charging them with a crime will come later, sentenced to death, they get a bullet in the back of their head, and the ambulances where the organ harvesting are taking place is just right to the side of the executioner's table itself, accepted as sort of reality itself. There's, in fact, a whole economy a black market in organ transplants from China itself? Or what about the harvesting of DNA from Aboriginal tribes, from people in Newfoundland, from the population of Iceland, which was viewed as like a hygienically sealed, you know, source of like pure genetic material itself? This kind of harvesting of organs and harvesting of DNA is like a logic that's really been well developed in, you know, in our culture itself. So all of these films go back and really, you know, I think just make one point over and over again that the boundaries are really blurred, that the techno world that we live in is no longer a world with ourselves as naturals and machines outside of ourselves, although that can reasonably be argued, and some of you have done that really eloquently, but you could also make the argument, in fact, that the boundaries are blurred and we have already become hybrids itself. And I just want to give you just an example of this which was taken from uh, when I was in Boston. And well, Boston is a city that calls itself, Boston, Massachusetts calls itself Gene City. Because if you read the business pages, they'll always start with here in Gene City. And that's because Boston really has invested heavily in molecular engineering and genetic engineering. And is a, like a new kind of 21st century city because it has you know, magnificent academic institutions, medical centers, you know, it's like a real center of medical technology and at the same time, center of recombinant genetics and, and molecular engineering 
into digitality itself. So Boston's this kind of city where you, know, you say, well, this is kind of like a, a hybrid mind has developed, you know, where the, medic, the leading medical advances migrate into the computer technologies like at MIT. And the whole thing is mixed together in a city, you know, which is, uh, you know, really is wired to the rest of the world. And the Boston, the Massachusetts government now puts, put a lot of money into attracting genetic engineering companies too. When I was there, there were 225 genetic engineering companies in Boston. You know, Kenmore Square, which is like, you know, the sort of like the new Silicon Valley of redesigning the body itself. And I just, um, do you have your hand up? Yeah, and <laughs> no, that's a very good. Uh, when I when I was in Boston as well, like oftentimes in the and at Cornell, in the student newspapers, you would see ads from uh, companies who wish to harvest eggs from women, and they were really wanted to get the eggs from, you know, the the genetically what they would define on the basis of class and health, intelligence, the genetically superior class, which were the Ivy League women. So there are lots of ads all the time about, would you like to make $1,000, $2,000? And this you know, was really aimed. And that's really like, have you seen the film Gattaca? Well, Gattaca's, you know, and I think in these cities, has in fact come right off the film script and walked into the streets itself. And you know, really the sense of really you know, consciously thinking about how do you create a genetically superior class has already been done. When I taught in Cornell and in Boston, I thought, the students just look different, actually. You know, I thought, you know, because they come from a very wuss, like deeply suburban, very wealthy family for generations in many cases, and to get into those schools were, you know, like stellar intelligence, like really hard work and stellar intelligence. As you walk across the campus as a whole, you say, well, hey, it's sort of like Gattaca, in some ways, you know, like really high performance orientation. Like I would have students tell me, or well, since I was the age of six or seven. You know, we were taught to take as many tests as we could. If the teachers don't give you a test, demand a test, because it's a good training for life itself. And I thought of the film Gattaca, you know, the tight preparation of the body, which is really ready to compete, and which will be superior in some ways. But while I was in Boston also, there was this article on, you know, chip technology. And it really reminded me how, and I just wanted to read it to you, because it really reminded me how the technologies don't stay outside the body, but slipstream inside. And at that level, you know, the, we can think of the notion of ourselves as hybrid. It goes like this. And think, keep in mind like Scott Buchanan's terminal penetration. I quote, the chip technology that drives a cell phone also drives the newest digital cameras. Similar chips power the MP3 music players that have rewritten the recording industry's business models. You'll probably find them managing billions of bits of data flowing over the nation's phone lines every second. They're used to sort chocolates and candy factories. Indeed, these remarkable chips are starting to appear in almost every device that links human beings to the digital universe. The chips are called digital signal processors, or DSPs, and they may be the most important piece of silicon in the world right now. DSPs are specialized computers that can digitally reshape the events of the real world, such as sound and images. And since everybody in the real world uses electronic gadgets, it's no surprise that engineers are cramming them full of these super chips. Thanks to its speed, the DSP can perform some magical transformations. Say, for example, you're using a cell phone in a really noisy room, a pub in Montreal. Now, little of that noise will reach the person on the other end. That's because the DSP uses complex math algorithms that can tell the difference between background noise and the user's voice. The chip instantly deletes much of that noise so that the voice comes through clearly. But hey, not too clearly. If the sound's too clean, if it's too hygienic, if you sound too much like a Blade Runner, the chip, that's my little additions, the chip will insert some digital dirt into it. It'll add just a minute amount of hiss to the line itself to naturalize the so-called natural voice. And the technology is even used to make machines see. 
Natick Vase Cognix Corporation puts DSPs in its Insight machine vision products used by manufacturers to automate industrial processes. The DSP uses its processing power to analyze a video input, recognize patterns, and control a robot. One such machine was designed by Cognitz for a candy maker to enable its robotic packaging machines to pick individual chocolates from a production line. So, close quote. So what's happening is that computing and data networking capacity is being silently and invisibly blended into the fabric of daily human life. Whether we like it or not, we are being interfaced. To what, to whom, and for what ends? Now I mention this because in the final article in this section, together with Alison Landsberg's Prosthetic Memories, Scott Bukatman talks about terminal penetration. And when he talks about terminal penetrations, like the DSPs, it's about how technology itself no longer stays outside of us in terms of these encumbrances of big masks that we have to put on or big Android machines. But really, the real cyborgs come inside us in terms of data networking capacities and electronic capillaries of information through which we circulate and the image matrix through which we circulate itself. Voice recognition completes the interface. Marvin Minsky, co-founder of MIT's Artificial Intelligence Lab, uses, somewhat alarmingly, that wires inserted into the nerves will allow the sensation of touch. For Timothy Leary, this represented the ultimate way to tune in. The computer literally knows where your head is. Or think of um, the cyborg in Toronto, Steve Mann. You know, who likes to wear, as I was mentioning, you know, the video output on his left eye, and his right eye, I should say, and who goes around, which gives him, he says, like really augmented power, because he can sort of edit the reality he wants to see and edit out the reality he doesn't want, does want to see. But he can also get his email messages, watch television. He, in fact, has an active other visual mental life going on with his right eye. And I saw him in Toronto recently, and Steve said, I'll see you later, Arthur. And he said, if you want, send an email, click into my right eye. So I thought, well, cyborg culture. You know, and Steve looked like sort of a natural, but then I began to think maybe he's gone over to the other side. That in fact he's intentionally to see what the possible dangers are and the possibilities has made of himself a cyborg. Now my thesis would be, and it's debatable, that in fact Steve does very consciously and visibly what has happened to all of us that the DSPs, the unnaturals, have streamed inside of us, that we have already become in very sophisticated ways hybrids, you know, part human and part machinic logic, you know, part of data networks. We depend on them in like, you know, like limited ways but very important ways. And who's to say where the human ends and where the artificial begins? And is it so problematic? I mean, are we so scared of that specter? Or have we already learned really creatively and intelligently and, you know, with really great, with great, sometimes great senses of humor and sometimes melancholic reflections to sort of negotiate the space? And so that a lot of our thought is taken up, you know, a lot of our life is taken up with living within the realm of the post human itself. It's a thesis. Yes. It, well, at that, I don't know if that time, I met him recently, Steve looked pretty normal. <laughs> he did, and not only normal, but I thought, well, like, because here's a guy who goes from Hamilton, Ontario, at the age of four is reading, you know, as soon as he learns to read, he reads electrical engineering textbooks. He said, told me that's all he was ever interested in reading, but follow the wires. And then, 
makes it a, you know working in his garage. He's like a you know like a punk musician, except he's working with robotics. And in his garage, he makes himself a cyborg headgear. He's really interested in wearable computer, and he makes himself a kind of head headgear for a very real purpose because he's. He says our visual reality has been taken over by propaganda machines, and we're under surveillance all the time. He says, "So what? Why can't I counter surveil right back?" And he likes to go put on a cyborg gear, and he goes in department stores, and he has films in which you know all the security agents will go up to him and say, "You can't wear that camera in the store." So after, have you ever tried to take a camera and go in a mall? Malls won't allow you to, for generally, in the states anyway, will not allow you to photograph in the mall. They'll rip it out of your hands. You go to security right away, which introduces a whole debate. Why is it the machines, the surveillance machines, don't like to be have counter surveillance exercised on them? So Steve Mann will say this. He'll say, "Well, he says I'm just doing counter surveillance work." And they'll say, "Counter surveillance? What are you talking about, sir?" And he'll say, "Well, you know, you look at one of the black bulbs in the scene, you know, the little where they hide the cameras all over the ceiling." He says, "Well, I never gave that permission. I came in here to buy something. I never gave that permission to take away my privacy." I'm just a customer in your store. I did not give you, in writing or anything, a right to steal my image or to take away my privacy. And they'll say, and you'll, on the film, you'll have people in the store say, oh, and they themselves probably don't even know. They'll say, oh, that's just a heat sensor in the ceiling and stuff like this. But Steve knows, you know, surveillance systems. says, no, it's not. It's, and so he then photographs and is made into films, in a film called Cyberman, the actual, you know, these kind of chronicles that go on. So for myself, he's like a pilgrim of the electronic way, who's you know involved in a very active critical political project, and that project is reclaiming the rights to privacy, reclaiming the rights to counter surveillance. And he's also, in, like if you're from Toronto, he's he's done this fabulous thing that I think is going to have real implications. He, I think I told you, he bought an art gallery because I think he's made a lot of money off his patents. He seems to have a lot of money. He bought this, or you know the AGO where it is in Toronto on um, Dundas? Yes. Well, there's a really nice building right across the street that is now Steve Mann's Art Center. Yeah. yeah. And you know, they're just fixing it up and stuff, but it's already, if you go inside, it's like an engineering marvel. And uh, just before this class started, I took part in one of his uh, actions, which was called the D-Conference. And the D-Conference is to really call to attention, sort of profile all these anthrax and smallpox scares. So we put out, you know, with a group of people, put out a call to, by invitation only, do you want to come and get photographed and scanned and stripped? Do you want to participate in de-conference? You know, prepare yourself for the quarantine camps. So we did that, and what the amazing thing was, you know, maybe 100 people were invited, but a lot of people came. There was, you know, the, the doors had to be shut because there were too many people wanting to be photographed and scanned and manipulated and showered and stuff like this. And I thought, well, big guys will come and do this. But predominantly women actually came. You know, it seemed to be two thirds were women, one third guys. And I knew, I knew a number of the women, like, you know, reporters for papers and stuff. And they, they, but they would say, well, like Rebecca from the Globe and Mail, she said, well, know, I had to really think about this hard. Did I really come, want to come and take a, like a, a laser shower and get photographed and have a shoot come down when it, should come down with my quarantine up. You know those outfits they give you that are made of select, they're not nylon material or something of the sort. They're, I don't forget the name of the material. But they come down and you can wear orange and white. So you're photographed and then a cyber voice will say medium and then there's a Steve's got a shoot there and the shoot brings down your costume and then you put it on, you know. And then you're one of the inmates walking around. Then afterwards then everybody got together with the inmates and the guards and the, I was one of the speakers, so I didn't have to wear any uniform at all because they had worn out, they'd run out of outfits anyway. So I said, well, speakers don't have to wear any. And then everybody got together for a discussion of quarantine and stuff. And I thought, well, it's really such a critical political action, you know, because it didn't just speak about quarantining these secret emergency plans of the American government, but actually profiled it. It got a lot of press play. And I thought Steve Mann was like really persistent. Because he says, now, you know, prepare yourself for the showers, basically. You know, it's really ominous. So I thought, well, here's a guy. He's, he works in a computer engineering at the University of Toronto, but is really doing these real smart political interventions in culture. So, so yeah, Steve, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and his class at the...
You know, I thought when I saw him, he was changed from two years ago because I thought he had a lot of media savvy sort of. You know, he sort of knew how to. He tries to be. Yeah. I think he's got uh, probes inside of him. I think he's got some kind of. Well, because he was telling me he's getting searched at every airport. So I said, why are you getting searched at every airport? And that can happen for two reasons. One, you get profiled. Like if you've traveled to certain countries, you have a good chance. And if you take a single plane fares for one direction, you'll get a profile. And you wouldn't want that to happen to you because you'll get stopped and strip searched at every airport. You just That's happened to people that I know. And they're, you know, they're not, you know, they're just people. They're not political involvements or anything. Yeah, but it'll also happen to you now uh, with the uh, paranoia of airports if you have any chip implants that they can detect, you because know, they can't find them. So, it's, uh, Cyberman, well, Cyberman was playing the theaters. I'll bring, I'll get the web page up next time. Uh, man, M-A-N-N, -N, I think. N-N. N-N, yeah, I think Steve Mann. You can actually just go up on Google, type in the name Steve Mann, Cyberman, or just Steve Mann. And you will you'll go to his homepage. And if not, I'll bring it in next week, his homepage. The really interesting person, he asks very complex questions. OK, I'll bring in the, um, could I just ask you, just before we break, the X, sure. Yeah, I'm going to try to get the video for next week, the uh, after Darwin, but the copy that I had seemed quite sickly. So we might be going on to the cyber Donna Haraway article. So could you read the Donna Haraway article, which is the Cyborg Manifesto? It's a really, really important article for next week, OK? OK, good. See you, everybody. And could you please give some thought to your papers and stuff, what you're going to do?